So we interviewed a former Baltimore police commander, Neil Franklin, who was a former head of training. And he said a lot of this corruption you see is tied into the war on drugs, something that Attorney General Jeff Sessions seems to be accelerating and expanding. Do you have any co uh, thoughts or comments about how the war on drugs uh, being prosecuted in, in a city that has so much poverty and lack of you know, unemployment, how that can lead to corruption? Um, I mean, so as we've said, you know, this case grew out of a narcotics investigation of a very <coughs> significant narcotics distribution organization that was able to operate for years because of the protection that Officer Gondo gave them and ultimately resulted in a in a fatal overdose. So um, there is certainly a connection between um, sale of illegal drugs in the city and then police corruption that, that we saw in this case. Yeah, well, there's corruption any place, anytime there's money. Um, there's likely to be corruption. Remember, a few years ago in Baltimore, we indicted this office, indicted 19 Baltimore City police officers um, in the uh, uh, towing scandal. And it was because there's, you know, you have an accident, you need to get towed. Um, that requires money. And then if you have a, 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 a towing dealership or car repair shop, they were paying the um, police officers to steer the, uh, uh, the people to them. Um, and so where you have money, um, inevitably you'll find uh, corruption. So there's a, there's a lot of money in drugs. When you compare the two, the money that they were getting in that towing scandal, kickbacks from the towing companies, it's just a mere pittance compared to what these guys were getting from robbing drug dealers and robbing other people, you know, who they may have thought were drug dealers or involved in some sort of nefarious activity. Uh, I understand the argument about, um, you know, if you didn't have this war on drugs, then there wouldn't be any violence, there wouldn't be any corruption. But I, I suggest that's a, that's a fairly naive um, 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 view. The primary reason that guns are being used in Baltimore, the foundation for it is the drug trade. If I'm going to work a corner, I got to have my protection. I can't call the police if I get robbed. I can't call the police when someone tries to force me off of my corner, my piece of real estate. I have to take matters into my own hands, which means I need a gun. My crew, they need guns. And again, because you can't call in law enforcement, when there is a conflict, we use our guns. And then you have retaliation. So if someone's trying to force me off a corner if someone's trying to rob me i gotta shoot him i mean the, the this case shropshire case started um because of over death over you know people were ODing on heroin and fentanyl that they were getting in baltimore city does anybody really expect that that, that law enforcement shouldn't address that should, should just sort of turn a blind eye to it and hope that as a result of no law enforcement in the area of, of drugs, that somehow violence is going to um, um, evaporate. I, I just don't think that's very realistic. Well, when we talk about ending the war on drugs, a lot of people think that we're just going to end the law enforcement response to what's happening in our streets with drug selling and drug using. But when you're ending the war on drugs, you're talking about ending drug prohibition. And, and with that, it means that You've got to have some form of legal access to the things that people use. And it's just that simple. When you ask people, when you ask our policymakers, our legislators, and, <clears throat> and more and more people today, when you ask them, should someone be criminalized? Should we put someone in prison for using drugs? Most people say no. I mean, very, very high percentage of people say no. And then my second question to them is then, shouldn't we have a responsibility then to provide some form of legal access to whatever they use? You know, whether it's, whether it's a, a doctor's prescription or whether it's a, uh, just going into a pharmacy or whether it's like we're doing with cannabis across the country as far as having um, um, retail outlets for adults to stop by and get what they want. In places like Portugal where they've decriminalized drugs and had safe injection sites, the number of deaths has fallen dramatically, yeah. right? And, and how many guns uh, do people have in Portugal? Right. That's, I mean... we got to wrap it up. Sorry. Thank you all. All right. Thank Appreciate you. it. Appreciate it. When you then ask them about Portugal, 
And of course, Portugal, they decriminalize possession for personal use of all drugs. The response was, you know, well, they don't have the guns that we have. <laughs> um, first of all, what they here's a, here again, we in the law enforcement community don't do a very good job of stepping outside of this place that we work to learn about what's happening, why it's happening, what are the details about what's happening. So in Portugal, what they fail to realize is that when even without legalizing drugs in Portugal, they've been very successful in moving it from a place of, of, of a criminal justice response to a health response, right? And that's primarily what they've done. And in doing so, um, more and more people feel comfortable in seeking help. They've, they've been successful in, in removing the stigma from drug use. And because of that, because of the dynamics surrounding all of this, number one, they now reduce the user population because more people are seeking help. Therefore, you're reducing the user population, which then also means that you're reducing the uh, selling market as well, which is illegal. But obviously, they don't even know. They've had a 22 to 25 percent reduction in teenage use in all drugs in Portugal because of, of what they've done making it a a matter of health instead of a matter of criminality. But the bigger picture here is that they clearly don't understand um, what it would mean to end prohibition. And by ending prohibition, that means, again, that you now provide legal access for people who use drugs. And any abusive behavior can be dealt with through our medical practitioners and mental health practitioners. In doing that, I don't care how many guns you have, now you're reducing, you're, 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 you're shrinking the reason, you're reducing the reason that people will use the guns. But these two guys, these two gentlemen that you interviewed, they clearly don't get the bigger picture of what needs to happen. Um, they're, they're keenly invested in what they do. I mean, think about it. Um, Jay, so if, if we ended drug prohibition, <laughs> if these two are not out of a job, their job dramatically changes, right? Um, so much of what they do surrounds the drug trade. So here they're investigating police officers and it surrounds the drug trade.